Hey, this is JD of JD's Man Cave. Coming at you again tonight on a big old Saturday night. We want to thank y'all for tuning in. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Hey, 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 what's going on, y'all? This is JD of JD's Man Cave here in Houston, Texas on a Saturday night where the weather has been wonderful all day today. We had a slight overcast with a little bit of, you know, it tried to look like it wanted to rain, but God held off on us, and I thank the Lord for it because my wife and I had a uh, outreach that we do every third Saturday, and we were able to bless some people with some toiletry items and some clothes and, you know, just shoes or whatever you needed today. And we just thank God for the blessing to be able to be a blessing to other people. So I want to thank the Lord today for a beautiful day that he sent our way and was able to allow us to pull the stuff out of our garage and give it away right in front of our house. So thank you, Lord. But yeah, anyway. Uh, let's get to some uh, pressing issues that's going on right now in America. And whether you know it or not, here in Texas, at least in the Houston area, uh, Texas all over the state basically is early voting. And I am a big supporter of voting. I have voted since I was 18 years old uh, when I was first eligible to vote. And uh, I voted in every election that I've been eligible to vote in. Uh, because for a while I was not eligible to vote, uh, but you guys know that <laughs> that's when you're on uh, parole in the state of Texas, you cannot vote. So, uh, you know, they took me off the shelf for a little, or put me on the shelf rather for a little while, but I'm back in action and back to being a good, honest, tax paying citizen. You know, so I, I admire the opportunity and, uh, I'm very zealous about voting. It's one of my pet peeves. I really don't like when people tell me, well, I'm not going to vote. I don't like the candidates. I'm, I'm, I'm not voting for neither one of them. When you don't vote, you just voted. You just notice, nullified yourself, and you have no recourse or no reprisal for the outcome of an election and what happens to you. But see, if you understood that if you have kids or if you yourself uh, get caught up in a situation and you are uh, dealing with the judicial system or the political system, which uh, actually dictates some of the, the laws that are that are moved uh, across these United States and how they can end up affecting you or your son gets caught up in a situation uh, as a black child going down there to the um, see the magistrate, as they call them the district attorney and all of those people who are voted in uh, and you didn't vote. Now all of a sudden your son ends up with 40 years for something he probably should have got four years for. So we have to understand the power that we have in electing our uh, government officials in whatever, you know, whatever capacity they serve, whether it be the uh, local state or the, uh, United, you know, the uh, government, the entire United States election. We need to participate and make our voices heard and understand our black voting power. Because as a black people, we have not always had the uh, right to vote. And that right to vote has been paid for in blood, sweat, tears, hanging, lynchings, uh, tar and feathering. Uh, any uh, an, uh, atrocity that they felt that they can bestow upon us to deter us from wanting to even try to participate in the political system. Uh, so I am a starch believer in getting out and exercising my right to vote because I understand the shoulders that I stand on as a black American. And we need to make sure that our voices are heard and that some of our agenda is at least pushed. But yeah, so I, I mean, I've had a good week. My wife and I got out uh, day one, uh, and, and which was Tuesday. We got up early that morning, got us a little breakfast in us, 
and we were one of the first at the polls here in our, uh, you know, in our neighborhood. And I heard so many horror stories about, you know, two hours in line, three hours in line, and them trying to deter people and all that. But my wife and I pulled up to the church because we went to a, a local church here. Went, pulled up to the church, got out the car, went in, showed our ID, uh, got our little uh, receipt, went to the poll, voted, got back in the car in all of a span of about 25 minutes. So, uh, you know, we, we, we weren't uh, exposed to all of the uh, atrocities that I've seen all over the state where people were in line for two hours and sitting out there camped out. You know, they even have a voting while you can sit in your car and pull up like you had to drive through a Burger King. So there's really no excuse for uh, people not to get out and exercise their right to vote. We have to quit being so uh, lazy and nonchalant about things that affect our lives directly and indirectly. Because we have uh, a lot at stake this time because Donald Trump is trying to hurry up and get a another uh, very, very conservative uh, judge put on the... Um, on the Supreme Court. And this young judge that he's trying to get on there can shape the judicial system of the United States for the next 40 years. So if you want to make a statement and, and understand that we need to uh, get rid of Trump's divisiveness, his uh, racist uh, antics, his uh, just his complete uh, what do you call it? He's he's not he's not capable of running this country. If you want to get rid of uh, his oh incompetence is the word I was looking for. If you want to get rid of his total incompetence, we need to get him out of office and to hurry up and and hopefully his uh, Supreme Court judge won't get uh, voted in before this uh, election has passed. So you know that's that's maybe wishful thinking on my part because. Let me tell you something. Donald Trump has played the entire United States. He played us to get in office. He's played us the entire time he's been in office. And he continues to play the political system like nobody I've ever seen. Donald Trump got a little pimp in it. I understand it. I see it. He got a little pimp in him. I can't talk down on the player's game. Let me tell you so. I, I, I sit back and, and watch it, but I'm also going to participate and make my vote heard. Like I said, my wife and I got out day one because we wanted to get it over with and no excuses. Get up, go do it. So I don't care who you vote for. That's not my business. But I do want you to vote as a as a black American. Let's get out here and make our voices heard, whatever, whichever way you want to go. That's your business. But uh, another thing I want to talk about is. Um, you have a comment. Okay, what's the Bernard comment? Lane. Bernard, okay, what's up, Lane? What's going on, brother? When you don't vote, your huh. opinion doesn't count. Exactly. That's what I, that, I and I appreciate that, Lane, because you're absolutely right. And I don't understand people who have sit around, sat around and and or sit around and or sat around this year and watch all the atrocities that have happened. The uh, Breonna Taylor, the George Floyd's, the uh, just the, uh, you know, just the ignorance that the black people have had to face and the tyranny that we face on a daily basis. A lot of that can be alleviated and diverted if we get out and vote these clowns out of office, these judges, these district attorneys, these sheriffs, these different entities that govern our local government. We have an opportunity to get out and get them out of office and let them know if you're not going to address what helps the black agenda, then we're not going to vote for you because they don't care. They seem to not care and they do it with um, if impunity. They act like they, there's no consequences to what they do. So as long as we like, let that keep happening and our voices aren't being uh, respected or heard in these local and these governmental uh, elections, we 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 can't really uh, complain. We can cry, 
but nobody uh, listening to the tears of a clown, man. Nobody, and that's what they see us as. They see them as tears of a clown because you're not supporting anything. You'll support when them new Jordans come out. You get your behind in line. You support them new movies, all that. You all in line, standing. You'll stand in line for that, no problem. Spend your money, looking crazy. Spend your last little two hundred dollars on, you know, that you should have used for your light bill. Now you in your Jordans in the candlelight. But anyway, that's not my business. But my thing is, we need to get out and do what's important to us, man, if we ever want to see some change. And I'll tell you this, they talk about change going to come, but it ain't going to come to you if you're sitting on your behind. You got to get out and do what you're supposed to do and participate in the elections. Get these people out of office that are not supporting black agenda, that have divisiveness in their heart. They're... Uh, they don't do anything as far as uh, fair with black communities. They are, you know, just out for total tyranny. We need to get rid of those people out of office. That's just not what conducive to the black man getting ahead. And that's really what we want as uh, black Americans. We want equality, first of all. We need equality first. Then we want an opportunity to get ahead. You know, that, and, and we are not afforded the opportunities when it comes to things like uh, lending practices, uh, you know, we're not afforded the same opportunities when it comes to fair housing. We're not uh, afforded uh, when it comes to interest rates and credit and things of that nature. We're not afforded uh, an equal opportunity in that. We're treated differently. Uh, as soon as they see African-American on that, on that uh, report, on that uh, application, the whole outlook changes. Let me tell you something. That's why I'm going to be honest with you. I named my son a name that they will not know he's black until he gets to the interview. His name is Christopher Sterling Daniels. Now, you hear Christopher Sterling Daniels, you think that's a white boy about to, about to walk in there. You, matter of fact, you are almost certain that it is. And here comes my son, six foot two, 215 pounds, all black man. You know, so you have to understand that there is, uh, you know, things that we need to get out and vote for that will uh, push our agenda and get us ahead in life. So another thing I want to talk about uh, is this NFL uh, situation that's going on. Yeah, I, I'm an NFL fan. I used to be a Texas fan, and I say that I used to be because hometown, I, until they get – they situation together. Uh, I'm just really not putting on no Texan gear. I'm not wearing nothing. I'm not supporting nobody. Because let me tell you something. Nobody roots for one in a row. There's no such thing as we won one in a row. Boy, hush. These people have uh, third grade plays that they run. They got rid of Bill O'Brien and won the very next game. So that tells you that he was not able to motivate these guys and get them up. They went out there and played for Romeo, but they're not going to keep Romeo as the head coach because Romeo is 874 years old. He's been in the NFL since leather caps, so we're not going to keep him out there. They're going to have to find somebody to be a head coach. They need somebody that's going to come in there and change the entire culture of that team because let me tell you something. i played football all my life, and – I was lucky enough never to be around a losing culture team. And what I mean by losing culture is that you get used to losing and you accept losing. And once you accept being a loser, you have no problem. You don't even strive for excellence. So the Texans have proved to me that they have a losing culture because year after year, they're eight and eight, nine and nine and seven. You know, 10 and 6 is about the best they've been that I know in this in this modern day era. And let me tell you something, that's that's just right at or or a little bit above uh subpar. You know what I'm saying? That's mediocre at best. And you cannot make it in the NFL uh and be a franchise that you know breeds mediocrity because you will never have a championship, you will never be. You know, you'll never be on top. And and let's just be honest with you. The system that we have, the culture that we have here in Houston is not conducive to winning. 
we are a team full of happy losers. As my <laughs> my high school coach, I never forget one time we were riding back from a high school football game. We were coming back from um, I think we were coming back from Port Arthur, Texas, and we were riding back on the bus, and everybody was laughing and joking because it was such a long ride, and we were happy. You know, just having fun with each other, getting back to school, you know, trying to get back to the school. And our coach turned around and let me tell you something. He cussed us out. When I tell you, he cussed us out from the top of that bus to the bottom of that bus, from the front of it to the back. He said, I ain't never seen a bunch of happy ass losers in my damn life. And hey, the bus got quiet as hell. Let me tell you something, because we did not want to be classified as no losers. When I tell you we lost that one game, and after that, we ended up in the playoffs because we beat the hell out of everybody else the rest of the year. So, you know, like I say, you have to reach down inside of yourself and 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 look for something uh, inside of you and make your team better. And the Texans just don't have those type of characters on their team. Those guys are happy and complacent. And, you know, it's hard to coach a bunch of millionaires. First of all, I understand the the you know the dilemma of coaching millionaires, but that's when you have to um, dive into a man's pride and make him bring out a little extra in him. You know, even though you know, like they say, they grown men, but you have to find and make them buy into something, uh, buy into your program, and you have to uh, you know instill a little pride searching for them and, and 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 make them bring that pride out and play with pride because if you don't play with pride you will get your behind with every week in the nfl that's not a not a problem they, they they got some guys out there that will destroy you week by week they have no problem with it that's what they get paid for and they enjoy it because let me tell you something i have tasted that winning and there's nothing like that taste losing is a bitter taste but man let me tell you something winning a game is the sweetest thing you'll ever go through in your life. And that's why I encourage parents to get their kids involved in some uh, sports as a youth because it builds character, it builds uh, discipline, it builds integrity, it builds everything that you need to get ahead in life. It breeds commitment, teamwork, it, it you know responsibility. It breeds everything, when you, especially when you play a team sport. You know, some of those individual sports like track and stuff like that, okay, that's cool. But when you uh, playing football or basketball, baseball, any of those multiplayer sports, you have to have accountability and responsibility on that court, on that field, on that baseball diamond, whatever, to your other players that are out there with you. And believe me, if you got some real leaders out there, can't go out there slacking. Everybody got to step their game up. You will get your head bust out there playing games. But, you know, that's just my little take on, on uh, youth sports. And I, I'm a big advocate of parents getting your kids out there, male, female, whatever. Get them out there and let them play sports. Get them, Let them try everything. You never know what they're interested in. You know, never know what spark will fly in that baby and turn into a raging fire. And, and may take some of them uh, education costs off so that you can – let me tell you something. I would have never went to college if I had to pay to go to Hampton University. Hampton University is $32,000 a year at the time when I was going. My parents didn't have a hundred and some thousand dollars to send me to school. But luckily, I knew how to knock people out their boots. And I was good at playing football. So they told me, come on, we'll pay for everything. So there it is. That's my little testimony and my little truth. Now you may want to start, if you ain't saving enough for that child's education, you may want to get him on the field somewhere and let him let him get himself together and get him a scholarship and go somewhere and get him an education. You know, that's just, you know, that's called forward thinking. And we as black Americans, sometimes we lack in that. We're not preparing our kids for a, you know, for a prosperous adulthood. So you need to get something, invest some time in that baby, get him to a little league situation, get him to a youth sports organization get them to some mentors, some education as far as tutoring. Do everything you can to get that child a head up because let me tell you something, as a black child in America, he already got enough going against him. He don't need you going against him too or not giving him every um, head start that he can be afforded. So yeah, so that's just my little take on that. But 
let's talk about uh so you got to hold on i think i got another go ahead young lady you made a comment on your page uh -huh. uh, that you pray that women don't get attached get it go ahead yeah well my my wife <laughs> I have some little comments that I make during the week, brother, on Facebook. I, I, I enjoy Facebook, and I do these things just to make us mentally stimulated and get us to thinking about our own lives and the lives that we uh, attach ourselves to. Uh, but I, I put on Facebook, I said, ladies, um, I pray that you don't ever get attached to another man that's not for you. Now, what I meant, and I got a lot of amens from women and a lot of, you know, hallelujahs and, you know, and that, that, that type of response lets me know that women are making the same mistakes over and over again. You are attaching yourselves to a man who is not for you. You have guys who are, or may have been for you and you, you know, you shun them or push them away because he didn't have a nice enough car. He didn't make enough money. He didn't dress nice enough. He didn't this, he didn't that, you know, you got a lot of, he didn't do, but the thing was what he did do was treat you right and honor who you were as a woman in his life. See, we got to quit thinking with the um, front of our, the front of our brain and, and, and start using the back of it too, you know, the recollection and all the hurt and the pain that you've been through and remember it. You know, you don't want to keep repeating the same cycle always going for the same type of guy, the same this that you're looking for. Now, the thing is, you need to get on your knees and pray for a spouse or a significant other and ask God to intervene and bring you some discernment on who is for you and what is for you and what God's plan is for you and the rest of your life. Because let me tell you something. There are some cats, there are some wolves out there in sheep clothing. And I know them because I cut I cut hair for many, many years. They called me JD the Barber for a reason. I was in the barber shop from 1999 to about 2000 and, 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 and what, 18? Yeah, I just stopped. Uh, I just got out of the barber shop about two, almost three years ago. But let me tell you something. I have seen these clowns that you get, ladies deal with. So I know what kind of mental capacity that you're dealing with and what shortcomings these guys have. And I know that I've seen y'all pick the wrong one time and time again. You have a comment, young lady? One of the comments on the post says, I don't do attachment, only connection. Right. Well, I mean, that's all that's the same. That's just a different word. And Bernard Lane says, <laughs> yeah. I think attachment and connection is the same thing. I mean, you 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 know, you may have a different connotation where you mean that you are, are linking up with somebody, but that's what attaching means. It means linking up as well. But you will end up, let me tell you something about life. There is one thing in life that you will never get back from somebody if you waste it, and that's time. You can get your money back if you if you waste it on them. You can get your uh, you know, your car back if you waste it on them. But your time is something you will never get back. So the thing about it is before you make these connections or attachments, whichever way you want to say it. You need to uh, really use your powers of discernment and, and your uh, cognitive abilities and see if this person really is interested in just you or are they just out for a good time. But let me tell you something. You don't ever want to get yourself caught up with good time Johnny because good time Johnny is just that. You're going to have a good time and then Johnny is gone. And believe me, I, I was good time Johnny for many, many years. So I know what I'm talking about. I, I was one of them cats who saw women, you know, from the time I was I was married by the time I was 22. I was divorced by the time I was 25. And from 25 until 48, I was good time Johnny. I, you know, women were just toys to play with. I mean, I did, you know, I saw who I saw and did what I did. And that was it. But, you know, I knew that there would have to be a better way. And I asked God to step into my life and start taking some things out of it that I did not see conducive to being a good husband, a good man, and a good um, significant other to a woman. 
So when I asked God to start removing those things out of my life, he did it. But I, it was a fervent prayer that I had to pray and be you know, honest that I was through with all that mess. And guess what happened? God sent me the woman of my dreams, the woman who was meant for me. You know, nobody, a lot of other women couldn't handle me. They, they didn't want to handle me because I was good time Johnny. But my wife saw more in me than I saw in me. And she was willing to stay and help me become a better me. And when you find somebody like that, then you got a, a real connection, as you say. <laughs> that's that's when you get a connection. When you find somebody who is for you. Yeah, go ahead, young lady. Uh, one of the comments. You said uh, Bernard had a, a comment. Oh, right? Bernard, I want to yeah, read his yeah, after this comment. Okay, all right, go ahead. On the post, uh -huh. a young lady put, she's so grateful for the opportunity to share my story with you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. See, I understand women. I mean, I understand, like I said, I, I, all the years I spent as a barber, I saw those guys walk in the shop. And I was I was privy to some conversations that you women will never hear. You know what I'm saying? Because let me tell you something. Guys come in the barber shop and talk about stuff that they'll never talk about to even their closest friends because they know in the shop it's like the black man's country club. And what go on and, and is said in the shop Stay in the barber shop. That's just a, a unwritten code, you know, that we that that we barbers uh, abide by. And the thing about it is, as a barber, you end up being a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a counselor. You are a mentor. You are a a confidant. You are you know a daddy to some cats, a uncle. You end up being everything to some of these guys that they missing out in the streets, and you really see the real them while they sitting there getting their hair cut because they get confident and uh, they get comfortable with you and they will talk to you and tell you and bounce things off of you. So I understand some of the um, idiots that you got. <laughs> I'm just saying like, I don't know what else to say. Some of the idiots and some of the shortcomings that you women have to deal with. And I know that there are some good guys out there. And like I said, there's some bad ones. There's some, uh, you know, what they call it, sheep a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah, there's some of those out there. They they re real fancy and, and shiny and look new and all that. But, bro, let me tell you something. As soon as you get home and take that package off, you ain't got yourself nothing. Some of them come as wolves. Yeah, some of them. Like, I mean, and, 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 like and they so cute. Right. And, and women women take those guys. They they love on them. They, 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 they give them some of their best years and then be mad and bitter. Cause they got nothing out of it, but you invested your time and your love in a hole that you can't never get yourself back out of. You drop that in a hole that you'll never be able to get nothing back out of, and you can't be bitter with nobody but yourself. What you have to do is find you somebody that's gonna help heal you and get you to your next level. And that's just now. What did Bernard? Now I want to know what Lane because he always got some good yeah, stuff. To I say. wanted to read. Yeah, I love I love when uh, Lane comes in because he's gonna switch the stuff a bit. Right, right, right. I think it is a I think it is great for women to make good money. Right. Please respect the man for who he is. Right. Oh yeah, I know. Hey, let me tell you something about it. women nowadays. Women are educated, especially us, us black women. I love y'all. I ain't gonna lie, I love y'all because y'all are the ones who are going out and getting the educations. You're getting all of the advanced degrees. You're getting all the training, all the uh, accolades. And then you go out and get a good job. And you end up making more money than most men nowadays. You know, we still have those hardworking, backbreaking brothers who are out there making real good money. You know what I'm saying? But it is only a plus if you are a hardworking brother who make good money and then you get to a woman who also is smart, educated, hardworking, and make a bunch of money as well. Y'all can build a, a hell of a team. Me and my wife always talk about the team concept. You know, we may not agree for real, but when we go against something, we are going to present a united front. Now, we may uh, argue in the back room, but when we walk out there, you're going to swear to God we don't want a court because that's just how we are. But that's because we let God lead our life. We don't lead, you know, no, no, neither one of us is more dominant than the other. You know, she lets me be the head of the household. She makes me think I am which I mean, you know, I really know that I ain't, but that's okay. You can fool me that way. Let me think I'm the head of the household and I'm making all the decisions. But I, 
you know, the thing about it is when you have a good head of a household, even when he makes the decision, he takes into account what he know. If he really know his woman, he takes into account what her mind would think and what, what her feelings are when he does something. That's when you got a good leader. But that's only a person who lets God lead his life first. You know, I tell women all the time, you got a man who ain't letting God lead his life, then you shouldn't let him lead yours. That's just bottom line. I, I know you brothers may be mad at me, but I'm just giving them a little game, and that's what I'm here for, brother. It's called a man cave, but sometimes you got to give the women they call it, man. You got to give them a little heads up, and, and if you don't like what I said, then get yourself together, brother. That's all I can tell you, and present a better you to a woman. You know, you can be mad at me all you want to. I don't care. All I do is state facts, brother. Now, as far as what Lane was saying, he is absolutely right. And Lane, I'm all for women making all the money they can make because I'm going to do the same thing. I want a woman like the one I got who got as much, if not more, hustle in her. And she got way more talent in her pinky finger than I got in my entire body. This woman can sing. She can she can preach. She she can do art. She creative as all. Oh, man, look here. I sit back with my mouth open sometimes in amazement. But that all I can say is that's God's work, you know, and I, I appreciate his, his blessing, you know, because it blesses our household time and time again. So I, I, I'm just thankful. But, yeah, you're right, Lane, and I, I, I appreciate that comment. Yeah, you got another personal comment. Okay, go ahead, young lady. Uh, I agree with uh, Bernard because a lot of times we think that we're doing something for God and the Lord. Or their maid, they tend to get disrespect to that man. I'm not talking about uh, good women that 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 are in alignment. Right. I was just about to go there. I know where you're going. Uh, I'm talking about um, women that is, and, and I'm gonna tell you something. That was in them before they started making that money. I was just about to say this right here. You the thing about that is, baby. That that that's that's so uh, ironic that you bring that up because let me tell you something. Even a woman who makes a bunch of money, but she has a godly outlook on her marriage, will know that that man is still the head of the house. I don't care if he make minimum wage. If she is, you know, she still lets him be the head of that house because there is a hierarchy in God's kingdom. You know, you got God, the husband, the wife, and then the children. That's a a godly hierarchy in a household. But some women don't understand. Right, they don't they understand that. Down. Exactly, they, they tear, tear their man down. down. Exactly, but it, the Bible talks about a woman tearing down her own house, you know, ungodly woman. But the thing about it is, women think that, you know, if you got a woman who's carnal-minded, she thinks that because she makes the most money, she got the most say-so. And that right there is out of order, out of line, and she will soon make that house crumble. That house is going to crumble so fast and she's going to wonder what, like it was built on sinking sand. <laughs> and then you look up and wonder why things ain't right. But you know, Bernard, I appreciate that comment, brother, because you know that is very insightful and very um, and like you said, it, it makes you think and makes good conversation and, and that's what people need to hear about here on this man cave because that's all I'm here for is I'm a black man trying to educate other black men and women if I can. And I tell people all the time, everybody only only people that are, you know, that 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 are 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 um, fools to me are people who don't think they can learn anything or can pick up anything new. If you think you know everything, I don't want to be around you, brother. You scare me. For real. You you are very scary because I learn every day and I try to learn something new every day. You know, that I didn't know yesterday, and that, that's just that's just me. And I'm 51 years old, and I, I ain't stopped learning yet. And I don't think I will. I, I hope I learn until they put me in the ground. You know, because it, it, it's always something new happening, something something new and improved. And I don't want to still be trying to use uh, the wheel when everybody else is flying. You know, I want to be able to fly too. I want to learn how to fly. <laughs> but yeah. So but, let's go to another comment on your page. Go ahead. I'm done wasting time trying to repair relationships I did break. Oh yeah, you know that that's that was that was made out of a uh, personal 
uh, situation. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell y'all what, I don't know if y'all heard it, but I posted early on my page that uh, I am done wasting time trying to repair relationships that I didn't break. You see what I'm saying? And what I mean by that is there are so many people who are mad at you for nothing. They they upset with you. They they don't want to have a relationship with you. And these are I'm when I talk about this, I'm talking when I say people, I'm talking about people that are so-called friends and family. More so family. Because let me tell you something, family are the type of people who will try to withhold their relationship with you to manipulate you. And whenever you talk about manipulation and uh trying to change outcomes of things, you know yourself that is in the bible is is um called witchcraft you know we don't want to we don't think of witchcraft when we hear witchcraft nowadays we think about the lady in the black dress with the old pointed hat on straight sitting there stirring a cauldron and all that with smoke coming up out of it and, and throwing frogs and ah nuke but that's not the witchcraft that the bible talks about the bible when they talk about witchcraft is whatever you do to try to manipulate a situation to a certain outcome that benefits you and you personally. So I get tired of children, relatives, family members, all of that trying to, you know, use their relationship with you or their lack of a relationship with you to manipulate you. So I, I, I put it in my spirit that look here, man, if I didn't break the relationship and do nothing to you, to make you not want to be around me, I'm cool with it. You ain't got to be around me. I'm not wasting my time no more trying to hunt you down, trying to be friends with you, trying to appease you, trying to pacify you. Look here, bro. I'm through with that. That wastes too much time. And I have too much time and too much energy that I can avert to doing some other work that's more productive than trying to make sure that you are all right with me. Because I have gotten to a point in my life at 51 years old well, I got a whole lot of I don't give a damn in my spirit. And you will find out real fast what I mean when I say I don't give a damn. You get it. Oh, man, if you don't do this, I ain't going to die. Hey, man, I don't give a damn. Go on about your business. As my dad, my daddy's favorite saying was, who you hurting? You ain't hurting me. So who you hurting? Who you trying to hurt? You know, I'm just looking at you trying to figure out who you hurting. Because you ain't hurting me by not doing it. And then his other favorite saying was, well, how this working out for you? You know, because I'm all for that. How is that working out for you? Whatever you wanted to do, if you did it, I just want to know how did it work out for you. Don't, you know, don't don't come to me crying about, well, man, I thought up. Uh, hey, bro, that was your decision. Out of your business, as they say. Out of your business. But, yeah, I just want you to understand that, you know, you have so many people who will try to use their relationship with you to manipulate you. You know, they, whether it be children, whether it be your, your spouse, your, your family members, your brothers, your sister, whatever, they will try to use their relationship to manipulate you and have you do what, you know, do their bidding, whatever they wanted you to do. And if you don't do it, then they try to draw back their relationship from you. And I'm cool with that. Let me tell you something. The only relationship, I re only two relationships I really worry about, well, actually it's three. I'm not going to lie to you. Is my relationship with God, my relationship with my wife, and my relationship with my mother. Those are the three relationships that I cover, you know, covenant, have a covenant with that I do not want to break. Those three. Anything else outside of those three, man, I don't care whether you like me or not. I, man, I'm really not concerned, bro. I don't care if you ever talk to me again. I don't care if you say hi, JD. I don't care if you come to the funeral. None of that. Because I'm not going to be there anyway. I'm going to be absent from the body. So you know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be present with the Lord. So if you come to the funeral, that's cool. Just get you some potato salad in one of them uh, leg quarters. And sit down somewhere. And stay out the way. But yeah. But you know, it's just so many people. And I get tired of it because I see it time and time again. And I'll be like, man, are you serious? I'm a grown man, dog. Don't play with me like that. You really don't know. And, and another thing that I hate to see people trying to do. Is hurt your feelings. Really, bro? You got to understand something about a, a grown man, a, grown, a man that's grown for real. You can't really hurt his feelings because we go through too much in everyday life that hurts our feelings. We, we get stone-faced. We get a poker face. We get a, 
a a a uh switch that we can turn on and off. You know, as far as uh you trying to hurt my feelings, you're really only wasting and spending your time. You could have used that energy for something else. Because as a grown man, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. I'm sorry, it's not gonna happen. Now I may hurt yours <laughs> because people who try to hurt other feel people's feelings usually are kind of soft. You know, they figure that if I hurt his feelings, you know, he he he'll he'll be, you know, he'll feel pain. Wrong answer, brother. You're not gonna be able to hurt my feelings. Unless you, you know, kill somebody in my family or something, then you ain't hurt my feelings, you just made me mad. Cause then I got to, you know, you know, like hey, I, I'm an eye for an eye type cat. It's in the Bible. Read it. Yeah, I'm cool with it. I ain't got no problem with it. But uh, yeah, this this, you know. This day and age, we got to get ourselves together, black men. We are in some trying times right now. We have a lot of political issues. We have a lot of governmental issues that are going on. We got a lot of judicial issues that we need to address and, and, and get ourselves in line to uh, be prosperous and to uh, flourish in this new America. So we need to get, get things together and uh, you know, it's just, it's just rough out here, man. It, like I say all the time, put your grown man on every day and wear it, man, with, with uh, kindness. You had another uh, comment, young lady? Babe? Huh? Yeah, you had some more comments you wanted? No, I'm just enjoying the show. Okay, all right. She said she's just enjoying the show. And I'm enjoying bringing the show to you guys. This is what I like to do, man. I usually have some guests on here, but I don't know what the guys are this week. You know, sometimes family issues come up and whatnot, so I have to respect that and just uh, bring you out, you guys, a uh, some good content on my own, and I'm cool with that. Another thing I wanted to talk about this week is college football. I don't know if you guys have been watching college football, but uh, there are a lot of teams who are not playing this year, and that really is a dilemma because I understand as a college athlete. Those guys on scholarship and their scholarships are contingent uh, to them performing on the uh, field. And when they're not on the field, it takes money away from that program. And that program also is not able to take care of them guys the way that they should be able to and let them advance their uh, education. So I'm, I'm real. I haven't heard anything about those guys that are whose schools are not participating in the uh, collegiate sports uh, you know, football, NCAA uh, football this year. I don't know if they're in school or are they still being paid for on scholarship or what. I need to, uh, you know, I need to, uh, what they call it, research it and see what's going on. I'm going to have to call up a couple of uh, people that I know that de deals with the uh, college format uh, every year and uh, see what they're doing with these guys because. We don't think about things like that when we're sitting there watching football, how these guys schooling is being paid for and how they're, you know, how it's contingent on them participating on the field. And then all of a sudden that's snatched away in the middle of their program as far as trying to get their education. And I'm all for kids going to school, especially collegiate athletes, because they fund the entire programs. Uh, there on those college camps. There are millions of dollars flooded into these universities because of these football programs, because of these television uh, contracts that they have, the commercial commercialism, the, uh, like I said, the uh, marketing that's done with these football programs. You have some of these uh, co collegiate programs who make more money than NFL uh, teams. And they don't have the salaries on the court, on the field that the NFL teams have. So that lets you know what kind of money these uh, collegiate programs are. You got kids who are out here playing football for a scholarship and an opportunity to go to school for free, but you paying our coach $5 million a year. Are you serious? So that lets me know what kind of money these programs are pulling in. You know, there's so much money in college football. That's why they were so – um, such in a hurry to get it back on the field. That's why they did not, uh, you know, uh, suspend the NFL season because of the money issue. These 
these guys are billionaires and they want to keep being billionaires. So they hurry up. They're not really worried about public concern, public uh, safety. They want these stadiums filled again. They want you back in there buying beer, buying hot dogs and nachos and sitting next up, up under each other, one on top of each other if they can. They'll sell two tickets to each seat if they could. You let somebody sit on your lap. So they're trying to make every dime they can. So don't ever think that these sports arenas are are, are worried about the public safety and worried about these uh, athletes that are on the field. That's not the that's not the drive behind uh, the sports the sport game when it comes to collegiate or uh, or uh, NFL. I found out when I was in college football. I heard a coach say something that. Never, never, ever, I forgot. It, it rang in my ear for the entire time I was there as a collegiate athlete. We were out at practice one day, and a young man, he was from, um, I think he was from Virginia. I, I want to say he was from Virginia or either North Carolina. I know he was a country boy type cat, so I, I know he was from the South. But anyway, um, he came through the hole. They, you know, he was a running back. And he came through the hole, tiptoeing, you know, dancing instead of hitting the hole and, and running the football, you know, to advance it. And he got tackled. I'm thinking he got lit up. He got hit hard. And coach ran over there and grabbed him by the face mask and pulled him up by his face mask off the ground. He lifted him completely. This is a, a 185 to 200 pound man. He grabbed him by his face mask and lifted him up off the ground and looked him dead in the eyes and said, hey, son, let me tell you something. All that tiptoeing and dancing, I didn't bring you here for that. He said, I, if, I, if I look in your eyes and I don't see dollar signs, you can't help this program make no money, you're not going to be here long. And he threw him back on the ground. And I looked at football completely different. That was my freshman year of college. I looked at football one for fun no more. I realized that if you can't help them people produce a good product and make money on that field, you're not going to be out there long. So – that's when I knew that football was no longer just a sport for fun. You know, I played from the time I was six years old all the way until I was 22. And it took me till I was 18, 19 years old almost before it came to that reality that football wasn't for just for fun no more. So, hey, man, look, let me tell you something. You have realities and you have uh, what they call uh, epiphanies in life <laughs> when the lights come on and everything looks different and that was a, a epiphany from a coach when he said look here man if i don't look in your eyes and see dollar signs and you can't help this program make no money you're not gonna be here long son you're gonna be back on the bus headed home to wherever you came from i said my god and let me tell you something the five years i was in college and played those first four I saw so many cats come in there and leave after one year because they weren't able to help the team make no money. They couldn't stay on the field. They couldn't get on the field. They 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 was not dedicated. They weren't committed to the football game. They weren't committed to the uh, getting themselves in a shape to be on the on the field. They weren't uh, made able to uh, attribute to us winning. Therefore, they were on the next thing smoking, as Coach said. You're going to be on the next thing smoking, whether it be a bus, a plane, or whatever, a car. You getting up out of here. So I, I commend these cats, and I just simply sit back and uh, have empathy for those who have been affected by this COVID-19 situation in the uh, commercial ranks, I mean in the collegiate ranks of football, because those guys are aspiring to be NFL players, but more so they are aspiring to get an education. And that's that's going to be a lot more important and a lot more conducive to them having success in life than any of that football that they play on the field. But to get that education, it's, it's, uh, it's a vital part that they perform and, and be committed on that football field. So my hat go off to those young men who are out there playing who are uh, maintaining themselves on those collegiate fields and getting your education. That, that would be my, my shout out to you. Make sure if they getting money out of you and getting you to play every week and making money off you, make sure you get your education and your degree and get something out of them and make it a win-win situation. You get, you get your education and help you with your life. 
they get the money out of you and help you with, help them with their program. That's the that's the best outcome we can have because collegiate level football and and other sports are nothing but um, athletic uh, training grounds. You know they 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 turn you into gladiators so that they can make money off of you, and then once you they done with you and made all the money they can make off of you, they let you go. Now it's up to you whether or not you went in this schoolhouse and got the degree because they paid for it. So it's up to you. So you can't be mad. If you played football and, and, and didn't get your degree, that's your business. You should have went to class, but I know I tried and bust my behind to get mine. I got I, I got my paper to show it. So they got they, you know, they they gave me a hundred and twenty some thousand dollar um degree. I mean, you know, education. And they made way more than that off of me. The, the four or five years I was there playing football, game after game. But I got my paper out of the deal. So they got their paper. I got my paper. You know, that's it. And that's the best outcome could have happened. And and I came home with a with a degree and no bill, zero bill when I left the campus. I didn't owe them nothing. They didn't owe me nothing. I'm out of here. And that's the best deal you can get. You know, all, all them student loans and all them, uh, you know, Pell Grant, you got to fill out paperwork. Oh, man, I ain't have time for all that. All I had to do was put my helmet on and go on the field. And then go to class, you know, I get done on the field. That was it. And I enjoyed my time. I, I tell people all the time, college, especially if you're a college athlete playing football or something like that, college, that's not real life. You don't, they don't, it don't really prepare, prepare you for life. Now they prepare you for it on, on the field because, uh, you know, they teach you all the attributes that you're going to need to succeed as a team player in life. But as far as, um, you know, paying bills and all that. You don't have to do none of that. You just out there playing football and enjoying life. And and, and that's a good thing because I, I enjoyed those five years that I was on that Hampton University campus. But I, I commend any kids that's out there doing that thing, doing that thing. What'd you say now, young lady? Huh. Okay. My wife tells me that we're getting down to the uh, nitty gritty, as they call it getting close to the end, and I want to talk about one of my favorite things to talk about, and that's hood shenanigans. Now, I, I like for people to send me some hood shenanigans, any of those people that are out there watching the show, I want you to send me some hood shenanigans that you've seen in your hood. Now, let me tell you something. I grew up in South Park, Sunnyside area. Brother, let me tell you something. I see hood shenanigans every time I roll down the street. Now, the biggest hood shenanigan I've seen lately is the fact that kids don't ride bikes no more. <laughs> Every time I see a bicycle riding down the street, all in traffic, rolling up and down Cullen, uh, you know, Scott, Belford, MLK. Every time I look up and see a bicycle riding down the lane, it's somebody 40 and up on it. Grown people on little kids' bicycles more than kids riding. You don't even see kids riding bikes no more. What are they doing nowadays? Uh, baby, what you think the kids are doing? If, 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 if Uncle Willie on their bike, gone. Uncle Willie riding them down the street. He he, 52 years old on a pink Huffy. Man, if you don't get your grown rusty behind off that little girl Huffy, and, and riding all the tires off of it, and if the tire busts, he can't even get it fixed for. Her. And he riding it with about six tires in his hand. Yeah, he got aluminum uh, doors and everything on the damn handlebars when he rides. You see that bike in South Park, the popular bike. They got all the reflectors on. Oh, you talking about old boy with the uh, he done made it with aluminum fall? He done made some swingers on the ten speed. Right. Yeah. No, man. no, no. That's another. Oh, that's another. The one that got the reflectors. Oh yeah, oh yeah, with the music, with the music and all that on it. Yeah, yeah, it's boy. Look here, boys. Let me tell you something. You know what that is, though. I'm gonna tell you what that is. That's somebody who done gave up on getting them a car. They say the hell with it. I'm gonna put music on my bicycle. I'm gonna put reflectors on this bike. I'm gonna put lights on it. Everything that a car got, I'm gonna put it on my bike because I'm not gonna ever have enough money at one time to buy me a car. And the, and the thing about it is, he probably. 60 years old with no uh, driver's license. He ain't never had a driver's license. Yeah, that, that, that's just hood shenanigans, man. Look, you got to understand 
that that the the hood is look, let me tell you something. The hood is better than Hollywood. That's all I got to say. Because Hollywood can't make up some of the stuff I done seen in my neighborhood, bro. You, they don't have no writers with an imagination good enough to come up with some of the scenes and the scenarios that I've seen played out in my hood. So every week, I'm going to bring y'all some hood shenanigans. And if you got some hood shenanigans that you want me to talk about, simply hit us up on, on one of these videos and, and leave a comment. You can hit me on my Facebook page and message it and leave a comment. And I will write it down and address it on JD's Man Cave. And we will make and leave your name with it so I know. Well, I mean, if you leave it a message, I'll know. But I'm going to bring your name up and who who's hood shenanigans we talking about this week, each week. I want you all to start sending me your hood shenanigans situations. And feel free to uh, put anything in the comment section that you want me to bring up and address on JD's Man Cave. And, and we look forward to your comments and your suggestions for the show. And we'll be back next week. And I appreciate y'all listening, tuning in. Oh, yeah. And Bernard Lane, let me tell you something, brother. I'm going to have you on as a guest. I hope you're okay with this. I'm, I'm going to call you and we'll talk this week. And I, I'm, I may have you come on as a guest, man, because I enjoy your uh, banter back and forth and, and your insight on just, you know, life. And that's what we look for. We're trying to educate these young brothers who don't have guidance and who, who are, are trying to find their way. So I'm, I'm, I'm Bernard Lane. Look for me to call you this week, brother. Cause you know me and you go way back like uh Cadillac four flats on the Cadillac. So I'll, I'll be hollering at you, brother. And uh, y'all have a good week and y'all stay blessed. And like I said, get out and vote, make your voice heard. And that's coming from JD's man cave. And we'll see y'all next week right here. Same time, same bat champ. <laughs>